okay? So this resulted in, in, the, in a collection of canon, uh, a collection or canon of, uh, of writings that was agreed upon by the vast majority of early church scholars, okay? So when we look at our scripture, it's, it's the canon of scripture that was scrutinized by early church leaders. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. Uh, there, there were some things that were not placed into this canon because uh, there, there was some uh, uh, dispute over, over their accuracy. And because of that, they were not placed in the canon of scriptures that we know as the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, some of those were placed into, into other works, uh, such as the Catholic Bible. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But that's why you see that there, there are some different collections there. Uh, but these early, these early uh, church fathers, uh, they supervised the collection, the acceptance, and the authentication of specific books to be included in the Bible. Now, the books of the New Testament were accepted only after careful and often extreme examination of the original as well as copied documents. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little more in detail. But they, cons they considered things, and this is why it's so important, they considered things like the historical setting, uh, the authoritative and collaborative nature of the documents, and the dis divine uh, revelation of their content. And so these were, not only was the Bible written by holy men as moved upon by the Holy Spirit, but these early church fathers were led by the Lord to, to discern what were the true um, books that needed to be included in this, uh, this canon. Uh, the canon of the Old Testament refers to the, 90, uh, to the 39 accepted books of the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, uh, refers to the 27 books of the, uh, of the New Testament. And the primary standard for a book's inclusion in the New Testament required that it be written either by an apostle or someone close to an apostle. Okay, so uh, just somebody that was just a good writer just couldn't come in and write a book in the New Testament. It had to be somebody that was inspired by God and had, had to be someone that was respected as an apostle or close to the apostles. And they guaranteed that the writings about Jesus in the early church would have authenticity of an eyewitness account. That's the other th great thing about this New Testament scripture. Um, because the, the, the New Testament scripture serves to validate everything that we read in the Old Testament. That's why we're going to uh, focus a lot on the validity of the New Testament tonight. It's because the New Testament, we use that to validate the writings of the Old Testament. And uh, the, just remember this. The, the Bible that the New Testament church used, okay, uh, that Jesus used was the Old Testament. It was basically the, the, the Pentateuch, okay? So that was the scripture that Jesus used, but he used the, the, basically the Old Testament as his Bible, okay? So that's why the New Testament serves to authenticate the Old Testament for us. Um, so the Apocrypha, uh, that's something that also we need to deal with. It refers to a collection up to 16 books that were con considered secret or hidden, uh, or originating between the Old and the New Testaments. These books were ha uh, handed down through centuries as valuable literature associated with the can canon of Scripture. They carried a particular history, but were of dubious origins uh, that were considered questionable by most scholars. And so that's when you, when you hear uh, about the Apocrypha, what, what they're talking about uh, are these books that did not make it into the canon of Scripture, into the Old Testament or the New Testament. However, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, and the Council of Trent in, in A.D. 1546 declared that 11 of these books would be uh, added to the, their canon of Scripture. Uh, therefore, today, those 11 only appear in Catholic Bibles, and those are not in our Scripture. Okay, so that's, uh, you just need to know that. And of course, the Septuagint, uh, Septuagint is the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament that was uh, created somewhere around uh, 250 B.C. by 70 Jewish elders uh, and, and more than likely, it's probable that the Apostle Paul used that translation when preaching to the Greeks at his missionary journey, okay? So this is just some of the background, some of the key words that you need to understand because we'll probably use some of these key words as we're talking about uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament and how we got that, okay? So let's, let's start out talking about the New Testament. Uh, and, and like I said, we're talking about the New Testament because the New Testament affirms, validates, uh, the Old Testament, and so we, we want to uh, talk about the New Testament first. Uh, the New Testament uh, books were written after the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Over, uh, they were written over a period of about, of about 55 years. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about historical writing, it's a pretty small period of time 
that the New Testament books were written. Okay, so they were written out after the death of Jesus. Uh, they're probably the first uh, uh, collections that we have is pro- were probably written somewhere around 45 A.D. Uh, onward, and uh, probably more than one written collection of uh, sayings of Jesus circulated in the churches. And so this is this is something that that we need to be aware of. The earliest of Paul's letters, because we we know this, the Apostle Paul wrote two thirds of the New Testament. But the earliest of Paul's letters uh, was uh, Galatians, and it's estimated to have been written in around 49 A.D. Um, tradition indicates that the Gospel of Mark, preached out of Mark this morning, love those miraculous works of Mark. Now, think about the, all the miracles that we talked about that's written in the book of Mark. Uh, we told you guys this morning that if you're looking for a book of miracles, read the book of Mark. And the book of Mark was written, was the first gospel believed to be written, and it was written probably sometime around 45 A.D. Um, some scholars believe it may have been a few, a few years later. But when you think about that, it, it, that that's, a, that's a pretty close time period after the death of, of Jesus. And so uh, these eyewitnesses' accounts of what happened in the gospel, this is not something that, was, that happened uh, 200 years, 300 years before this, this, these Gospels were written. No, it, it, we're, we're talking about time periods of, of uh, for most of the, of the entire New Testament, less than 50 years after the events that occurred that these books were written, okay? And I know some people say, well, why didn't, why didn't they just write it along the way? Because I, I know, you know, you, you watch The Chosen and, and Matthew's, uh, you know, Matthew's, he's writing as he walks. Um, but but uh, what we have to realize is that they never could have ma- imagined uh, that, that w- they thought they were just following a teacher that was going to take over or do a military takeover over uh, Roman society. They never could have imagined that he came, even though he told them that his, his kingdom was not of this world. I mean, he, he, he came out and spelled it out to them. But yet they still couldn't imagine that he was coming to establish an eternal kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And if so, they probably would have... Uh, um, um, documented it as they went. We'd probably had, no wonder they say m- many more works did he do uh, that are not recorded in, in, the, in the Gospels. Uh, but, but he did that. Uh, for the most part, the original language in the New Testament uh, was Greek, and, and most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, although there is some Aramaic in there as well. But we do consider those the original uh, languages of the, of the uh, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, Are New Testament copies reliable? Uh, Because um, we have no, as far as New Testament original writings, you know, written by the hands of the the apostles, we don't have any surviving documents that were first-hand written originals, okay? So we don't have that. What we have is meticulous copies. And I say meticulous copies because they were very careful. Um, Scribes in those days were very careful to copy, and they were handwritten copies. And so the copies of the New Testament that we have were meticulously copied uh, documents uh, from the originals that were passed down from generation to generation. But the early manuscripts are very uh, precious because they tell of Christ's coming. They tell of his life. And there's many letters telling about the growth and the expansion of the early church. And because they were so valuable, they were considered uh, uh, sacred. And, and, and because they were sacred, they were copied with, like I said, it's not just like if, if, if you said, hey, copy this list down and you show me a picture of your phone, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use shorthand and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do something that gets the gist of it. And that's not the way. These were sacred writings because it told of the, of the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection and the establishment of the early church. And so, because they were so sacred, they were meticulously copied word for word from the original documents as to not lose any meaning from them. So, like I said, none of those original documents uh, exist, uh, but what we, and, they're, and they're, uh, those documents are referred to as, as from scholars as, uh, as original autographs, uh, they don't survive. So, uh, here, here's the, the incredible thing is that um, no scrap of parchment or, or papyrus or anything like that bearing any of that handwritten uh, uh, originals have been discovered so far. I say so far because we're discovering new things all the time. Uh, uh, I was reading today about new tablets that had been discovered that they're not, they're not the actual scripture, but they're tablet, tablets from ancient texts um, 
uh, as early as uh, 700 or 800 B.C. that refer to certain scripture in the Old Testament, uh, proving even more that the Bible is what we claim it to be, which is the story of God. Okay, so that's, uh, I think that's amazing. But before the original documents disappeared, like I said, they were meticulously copied. And these copies of, of, the, writing, of the original writings are the texts on which our current Bible translations are based. Okay, um, and I know you guys thought it was, you know, King James uh, Version was, was written uh, by the apostle himself, but, but that's, not, that's not the way I, 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 I jest, okay? Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. If you grew up in one of those churches, you kind of get it. Like, you, you, can, you can laugh along with me. And I still like the King James too, but I like any of those um, uh, literal translations of the Bible. Uh, the earliest complete New Testament manuscript that's available uh, is still dates back to about 300 A.D., and that's the last um, complete New Testament that we have is about 300 A.D., uh, but what we find is the process of copying and recopying the Bible continued for centuries um, uh, until the middle of the 15th century. And I think this is amazing. Until the middle of the 15th century, all copying was done by hand. Could you imagine writing the entire new, copying the entire New Testament? And so if you wanted to send a New Testament to another group of believers somewhere, you sat down and you copied the New Testament word for word so that you could get that sent to a believer in, in another part of the country. And so we, sometimes we don't appreciate what the early church went through to preserve this that we have. You know, it's easy for us. Uh, I, I, I went on Amazon just because I wanted this particular Bible. And I went on Amazon and it was sitting at my door in two days. I didn't have to do anything, but I didn't even have to go to, go to my cart. I did one step, you know, whatever it is, one step by or whatever, one click by or whatever it is. And yet, sometimes because things are so easy for us, we don't appreciate what the early church went through to preserve what we have in this New Testament. They had to, they had to copy it word for word just to send it somewhere else, okay? But with the invention of, the, of, of printing in Europe, copies could be made in greater, uh, greater quantities, and, and that led to what we see today. But each copy of the Bible had to be produced slowly by the hand uh, with the old system. But now the printing press, we, we see thousands in, uh, of copies in, in no time, okay? So let's talk about these manuscripts, because I think this is very important. This is where we need to kind of take some value out, out, out of this, is that the older handwritten copies of Bible texts are called manuscripts. These copies of that original text, we call those manuscripts. And early manuscripts for the books of the Bible were, were, were written on papyrus or on some kind of skin. But papyrus was a type of ancient paper manufactured from a reed plant that grew in the Nile Valley sim, and in similar environments. But papyrus was very expensive, but it wasn't very durable. And that's why we don't have the original writings around anymore. Only the copies of the original writings was because papyrus, although it was expensive, it wasn't very durable and it rotted quickly when exposed to dampness. And so the ancient papyrus uh, manuscripts, which have been discovered, because there have been a few manuscripts that have been discovered in part, were found in dry sands of Egypt and other arid places, okay? So great quantities of the inscribed uh, um, papyrus plants or uh, paper have been recovered from the Egyptian sands in the last hundred years, dating from a period shortly uh, before and after the beginning of the Christian era, about 30 A.D., okay? And a few of these scraps of, of papyrus paper contain ancient texts of the Bible, which once again shows us it dates back to a time period that gives us confidence that the Scripture is, um, uh, is authentic, that, that it is authoritative, okay? So that's something that we need to take uh, away from this. So when looking then, and do some research on this, the way that, that historians that study this, the way that they look at how, uh, how reliable is a text is they compare it against other texts. And number one, what is the quantity of texts that are available? What are the uh, uh, quantity of original or, or, or copied manuscripts that are available? And number two, how far from the original event did the writings take place? So there's two things they look at on how valid can a text be. So when looking at these, how, how does the scripture measure up against other texts? Now, Let's take a few things. Let's take like uh, um, Caesar's uh, uh, history of the, of the Gallic War. That's something that history, you know, we teach in history, we say that's very valid, it's very reliable. And we see that there's 10 manuscripts in existence. Uh, original manuscripts are copies of the original. There's 10 original manuscripts in existence. 
Um, the works of Plato. Uh, we see there's seven manuscripts that are in existence. And yet, we, we talk about things that were written by Plato. And there's seven manuscripts in existence. So, just, just putting this out there. Um, the Iliad. 643 manuscripts that are available. And so, they consider that to be uh, very valid. Very reliable. Because there's 643 of them. Okay, the New Testament. Five uh, over 5,000 Greek manuscripts available, 10,000 Latin manuscripts available, and 10,000 of other languages that are avail available. I, I was in a dispute, uh, just in a, in a little, uh, yeah, it was a dispute. Um, it, it started out as a conversation, it ended up being a dispute um, with, with a, a, a Muslim man, and he was talking about all of the, the uh, translations, these early translations while he was talking about the Greek, the Latin, uh, all of the other languages. He said, your Bible is not accurate. It was translated so many times. And, and I told him, uh, from a scholar's, because I, I, I'd already read this, or I looked this up and verified this, and I think the Holy Spirit prepared me before I ever talked to him that day. I told him, as a matter of fact, the more times that a document is translated into another language, the more accurate it becomes. Because every time you translate a document into another language, every time it's translated, then you find the more concise, the more um, uh, accurate meaning of the words that are written. And so the fact that the Bible was translated and so we have original ma manuscripts of so many different languages that, this, that the scripture were translated into, it, sir, it shows us that the accuracy of the Bible is greater than any other document that you can find that we consider a reliable ancient text. More copies of the Bible, of the original manuscripts of the Bible, than any other ancient text. And yet still people uh, want to question the validity of the Bible. And so, so that's, that's the number of documents that are out there. The other thing they look at is how far from the actual events were these, were these written. Okay, so how does the New Testament measure up in that way? I say when it comes to Caesar's Gallic War, how does it measure up? Well, we see that um, the earliest, uh, it was written in 100 B.C. The earliest manuscript that we have is from uh, 900 uh, A.D. Some of those are dating to about 1100 A.D. And so almost a thousand year gap from the original writing to the earliest manuscript that we have a copy of. Because we don't have any of the originals of any of these. We all only have the manuscripts, the copies. Um, so you can see there's a thousand year gra uh, gap. We still uh, consider that to be a valid document. Uh, the works of Plato was written in uh, 400 BC. The copy was 900 AD. And so you can see there it's a gap of about 1300 years. Uh, between the, when it was original written and the manuscripts that we have today. The, the earliest manuscript we have today is a 1300 year gap. And yet, we still find that to be a reliable document. The Iliad, Homer's Iliad, uh, was written 900, in, uh, um, 900 B.C. The earliest copy we have is 400 B.C., a 500-year gap. So once again, very reliable document right there. Let's look at the New Testament, though. When you start looking at how reliable is it, uh, the New Testament was written between 45 and 96. The earliest copy that we have was A.D. 125. There's been a fragment of John's gospel that was A.D. 85. Uh, most are 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. But the gap are as little as 35 years. All of these other documents throughout history that you look at that have, have gaps from the date of the original writing to the manuscripts that we possess are anywhere from 500 years to 1,300 years. And we consider them to be reliable, valid documents. In the Bible, we see that as little as 35-year gap from the time that it was originally written and the manuscripts, copies of the manuscripts that we have in, in our possession today. It just goes to show us that the Bible is what we think that it is, that it is valid, it is reliable, not only for our faith, not only because we have faith to believe, but historically it's an accurate document. Historically, we prove it out historically to be, to be reliable. And maybe you don't geek out on that stuff, but I absolutely geek out on that stuff. I love that stuff. I love the fact that we can historically prove that it is. Now, now we also believe that it was the, these original writings were uh, written, um, it says before but 45 to 96 A.D., but most of those were probably written before 70 A.D., uh, just so that you know, closer, even closer to the time of, uh, to the, of the death of Jesus Christ, to the Acts of the Apostles. And so the time gap 
between the historical accounts and the time they were written, or probably even closer than we give them credit for. And the reason why is because, let, let's, let's, take out, let's take out the book of Revelation in the last three uh, letters of John. Um, but the rest of the New Te Testament books, there's a solid basis that, that none of them were written later than uh, at least 80 AD, 50 years after the death of Jesus, because most of the New Testament was likely written before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. How do we know that? Because that was a significant event. And nowhere in any of the scripture that we have in the New Testament does anybody mention the fall of Jerusalem. Nobody mentions the fall of Jerusalem. It was something that Jesus alluded to, so surely if it had happened before the, the, the scripture that we have was written, then surely the writers in the New Testament would have written about it. But nowhere do we find that anybody wrote about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So that means, uh, uh, or, or even perhaps before the fire of Rome in 64 AD as well. None of this was written about uh, that we find in the scriptures. And so, um, you know, like, like the Muslim community wants to say that, uh, that our, our New Testament wasn't compiled until 2nd century. Uh, that's just not, that's just not so. History doesn't bear it out, nor does the accounts of the writer bear it out, just because of what they included and what they failed to include in the document. This would have been, if Jesus had, a, had uh, mentioned and, and predicted the fall of Jerusalem, and it had already happened, don't you think that it just serves a reason that the New Testament writers would have included that in their writings? But you know why they didn't? Because it had not happened yet. Because... The Bible wasn't written in 200 A.D. the way the Muslim community wants, us to, wants to, to believe, put out that propaganda. The Bible was written much earlier, which bears out to uh, the original manuscripts. Okay? Uh, the same logic can be taken a step further. For instance, the martyrdom of James in 62 A.D., Paul in 64 A.D., and Peter in 65 A.D., all of them major church leaders, yet their deaths, you know, and, and you know what? Their deaths had to be big in the Christian community. It had, it had to be something that sent shockwaves across the early church. Yet, we don't find the deaths referred to in any one of these 27 canonized books. And you know the reason why they're not mentioned in there? Because they hadn't occurred yet. Because the scripture was written before this time. Okay, so we can see uh, the scripture was written very close to uh, just, just, just a, a number of few decades after the death of Jesus and very close to this, uh, well, the acts that we read in the early church. And so they're very historically reliable is what we're, uh, we're talking about. So let's, let's compare that to the Quran. Uh, since, we're, since, since they like to make uh, accusations about the Bible. Uh, being written uh, 280. Let's, let's compare this to, to the Quran. Because prior to 750 AD, that's 100 years after the death of Muhammad, by the way, we have no verifiable Muslim documents that can give us a, uh, any kind of viewpoint into the formation of Islam. Nothing. There's no verifiable documents. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're, most of the, of the writings that we find are uh, well over 100 years, almost 200 years uh, after the, the death of Muhammad. Um, even, even the fact, and you can go and you can read this for yourself, uh, history, history itself refutes some of the claims that are made in Islam because uh, one of the things that Islam claims is that there was, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, um, people, the, the Muslim people that was in that, the Arabic people and the Jewish people had a qualm, but history bears out that they were actually very friendly with each other well be, beyond where, when the time of the death of Muhammad would actually occur. And so history itself doesn't even line up with what the Quran states in its own writing. But, but I look at this. Uh, so the, the primary sources that we, that we possess uh, for the Quran are anywhere from 150 years to 300 years after the events that they describe. Uh, I mean, that's when, when you look at, at lining up with things. Also, what we'll find is there's no early texts uh, that, that uh, uh, the Islamic people can point to, to what the historical accounts that, there's many historical accounts in the Old Testament that what you find is, and you can go, go, go do a study on this and compare it out. They take the, the um, uh, occurrences in, the, in our Old Testament of creation, our occurrences of a lot of the life of Abraham and different things, the flood, different things like that. And they go and they've made changes to them and they've included it in their texts. 
Yet none of these texts before this uh, 750 to 800 AD can be found. And so there's nothing to substantiate their claims that their book is truly a holy book. As a matter of fact, it came along almost, think about this, guys, almost 700 years after the New Testament. This is, this is well over almost 2,000 years after some of the earliest texts that we have that we've been found of the Old Testament. And so when you start talking about the authenticity of a document, I think that we can see historically that the Word of God, the Bible that we have, is absolutely infallible. Not only from a spiritual standpoint, but also from a historical standpoint. Okay? So that's, that's New Testament. I get, I get pumped up when we start talking about the New Testament because uh, I believe it, and I love when you can take history and you can bear it out in history. Okay? So let's talk about the, the Old Testament. Now, the books of the Old Testament, uh, they were written uh, over a period of, of about a thousand years. And I, I know you say, Pastor Scott, they, I, the earth goes back to 400 B.C. and uh, the creation story. I, I know, I'm just saying when it was written. It was written over a period of about a thousand years because we believe that Moses most likely wrote them after his divine call to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And that's somewhere around 1491 B.C. And most scholars believe it was written between 1491 B.C. all the way up to around 450 B.C. with the book of Malachi. And uh, that's where we take our Old Testament. But, so about a period of a thousand years. Um, most of them were written in the Hebrew language, except for, uh, except for a few selected passages that were written in Aramaic, Okay. Uh, Moses is believed to be the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, his writing of the creation and the fall of man, that was, those were writings that date, dated back uh, and were passed down through oral history, dating back to about 404 B.C. is where most scholars believe. Uh, and they were, they were back then, there, there wasn't written language. There wasn't a way to record those documents. And so that was passed down through oral history until the time that it was written uh, by Moses and somewhere around that uh, 1491 B.C. date that we give. So uh, we believe that God enabled uh, Moses by the Holy Spirit to have the wisdom to record those things so that it could be passed on to us later on. Now, the arrangement of the books uh, and the chapters of the Old Testament um, uh, that, that we are familiar with today, uh, those are inherited from a pre-Christian Greek translation uh, called the Septuagint. We talked about that. And that's why they're organized uh, in the way that they are. And, and you'll probably notice that, um, that they're not necessarily chronologically ordered. Uh, if you go back and you read parts of the, of the Old Testament, you'll find that there's some skipping around back there. But this was uh, the, the, or, the order that we have today came from the Septuagint. Okay, so that's the reason why. Um, and the reasons for not following chronicle, chronological order, we don't know. It's been lost in antiquity, and so we don't know what the reason was uh, for them not doing that. But we believe that still, uh, these, these early fathers, they, they were led by the Holy Spirit when they were putting this together. So uh, the Bible is that um, authoritative uh, record that was written uh, by, the, uh, by holy men as moved upon by the Holy Spirit, and we believe that. So let's look at a, a quick er, uh, historical timeline of the Bible and uh, we'll try not to, we'll try to leave time uh, for questions. Hopefully that will, uh, that will work out, okay? Okay, so historical timeline of the Bible. First of all, 250 B.C., the Hebrew Old Testament scrolls translated into Greek and called the Septuagint, okay? So that the, the first uh, Old Testament that we have, a complete work of, was in 250 B.C., okay? So that's, uh, uh, for those of you who, 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 Maybe you weren't raised in church, and, and, and maybe history is not your thing. If we're on a timeline here, and, and we start at the beginning of time over here, everything that, you got, you got zero right here in the middle, okay? Everything that happens before that, that is counting up B.C. Everything that happens after zero is counting up A.D., okay? So, so when we start counting backwards, 250 A, uh, B.C., so we're counting back from the year zero, okay, so that's, try, try to g wrap your mind around that, because some of you I saw when I talked about, uh, you know, being 450 B.C. to 300 A.D., and I said that was 750 years, you're like, what? 
What are we talking about? It's like 170. No, 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 no. No, we're, 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 we're B.C. and A.D. here. So you've got you to cross that scale and look at all, all of history. Um, uh, zero to 33 A.D., that's the life, the death, the birth, uh, the birth, the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, we said this, he used the Hebrew Old Testament as, as his Bible. And so uh, we believe he lived uh, 30, we know he lived 33 and a half years according to the Word of God. And that was from zero to 33 A.D., um, uh, the, from 49 to 100 A.D., the apostles and eyewitnesses of Christ recorded and distributed uh, the original gospel accounts in handwritten letters and copied manuscripts at that time. Most were written on papyrus, we told you that, uh, but they used both the Greek and Hebrew Old Testaments as their Bible. And so that, that works us all the way up to 100 A.D., okay? So just know, from, from 250 B.C., that's when the Septuagint was written. That's that, that, that Hebrew Old Testament written into Greek all the way up to 100 A.D. That's where we see all of our writings, okay? So that's the main writings of the Scripture in that time period. Now, everything after that is going to be what happened that brought us the New Testament, the Old Testament, like we have it today, okay? So this, 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 let's kind of jump into that. I know there's a lot to cover tonight, but the notes will be on, on the uh, website, so you can go, but they're already up. So you can go to, the, our, to our website, fowcnorton.com, and you go to our School of Christ tab, and you can download the notes for tonight, because this is a lot, and I'm skipping over some of the stuff I'm having in, in my notes just for time's sake, and you can pick up on some of this that I left out as well, okay? Um, 150 uh, to, to 397 A.D., for nearly three centuries, we had handwritten copies of our collections of the indiv individual New Testament manuscripts that circulated throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, some translations were made from Greek into Latin uh, to Syriac and other Coptic languages. And so uh, just realize, like we said, the more a document historically, um, linguistically, the more, the more a document is translated into other languages, the more care that is taken to make sure it is accurate. So what historians find is the more something is translated, the more accurate it becomes. And so don't, don't let anybody tell you that because of all these translations that the Bible is not accurate. No, history bears out that it's even more accurate the more something that is, is translated. Uh, the various bishops and Christian leaders began to agree on which book should complete the New Testament. And over the early centuries, uh, uh, great Christian minds, they, they studied and they committed themselves to these manuscripts. And finally, in 367 A.D., the Eastern Church of Alexandria, it's in Egypt, and, 300, and, and in 397 A.D., the Western Church uh, of Carthage in North, Af North Africa agreed on the Greek version of 27 books we now have as the official New Testament. And so we find that these writings go back uh, all the way to, to first century, but in the third century, uh, almost, almost the, four, the fourth century, that's when it was agreed upon which of these books are going to be in our New, te uh, New Testament. Uh, in the year 400, I guess, a uh, year 400 uh, to 1546, uh, Jerome from Italy translated the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek Testament, totally new Latin version called the Vulgate Bible. And this translation was done uh, from 382 to 405, okay? Um, it's the, it was true, the original manuscripts, uh, true to the original manuscripts and became the official Bible of the Western world for over a thousand years. You think about the work that was done there and the work that people put in. Smart guys, brilliant people put into making sure that the Word of God was translated accurately and delivered to people accurately. Um, from 500 to 950 A.D., a more exact version uh, of, the, uh, of the Old Testament uh, called the Masoretic uh, Text was developed by Hebrew scholars. And this became the authoritative edition of the he Hebrew Scriptures and, 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 and which... You know, we, we see that uh, uh, the vowels were added to the consonant only Hebrew text. And so that's, that's something that uh, we're thankful for. It wasn't until 1228 A.D. This is something that some maybe, maybe you didn't realize. It wasn't until 1228 A.D. that chapter divisions were given to the books of the Bible. Before that time, it wasn't written in chapter and verse. It was just a complete writing of the Scripture. Could you imagine how, how tedious it was to study the Scripture before chapters and verses were introduced? And so that wasn't uh, introduced until 1228 A.D. Uh, because uh, each book of the Bible was just one long arrangement of the text. 
In 1380 AD, John Wycliffe translated the New Testament and most of the Old Testament into 14th century English uh, using the primary texts as his, his work for that. And then for what we know, we're more familiar with, was in 1525 to 1530, William Tyndale translated both the Old Testament and New Testament into 16th century English. And uh, he, he suffered uh, much harm uh, for his work. In, in translating that scripture. Um, uh, well, I can't remember the exact quote that Tyndale made, but uh, he, something about the, the, that the, the plow boy would, would know just as much about the, the, the scripture as the, I can't remember said the king or the priest or, who, or whoever, uh, the bishop, whoever it was. And so he had a desire that the word of God could be read by everybody uh, in, in England. So that's uh, everybody in Europe. So that, that's, that's pretty impressive uh, right there. 15, uh, 1535 to 1539, Miles Cloverdale, Mr. Matthew published separate Bibles in the 16th century English, and they primarily used Tyndale's research uh, for their work. Uh, and then in 1551 AD, verses were added to the chapter divisions in the Bible. So we're all the way to the 1500s now before, before uh, verses were added, okay? So we talked about how uh, back in 1200, the chapters were added. We're in the 1500s now before verses were added. And so it's starting to look more like what we see in our scripture today by the additions of the chapters and the verses. Because when Paul wrote his letters, he didn't do it in chapter and verse. And so that's something else that we need to, I know people get hung up over certain translations. Just know that everything is a translation. When you study the scripture, everything is a translation. We just need to make sure that it's, it's, uh, it holds fast to the original uh, writings of the scripture. Okay, uh, 1560, the Geneva Bible and the, and the, and the Bishop's Bible were created. Uh, and in 50, in 50, I'll just kind of go through some of these. Uh, the 1582, the Douay Bible, created by scholars of the Catholic Church, reaching back to the original versions of the Bible. Um, this translation does uh, contain or did contain some controversial notes all the way to modern times. Because like I said, some of those, some of the, the, the books that were not originally allowed into the early versions of our Christian Bible were allowed into that Catholic Bible. And uh, some, of those, uh, some of those notes uh, were not generally accepted and have now later on have been taken out of the Catholic Bible. Some of the notations were. So just kind of know that. Just not, not slinging anything, just educational purposes. Uh, 1611 AD. I know some of you guys perk up when you hear 1611. Uh, but yeah, Pastor Rob's like, yes, 1611. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the authorized version, right? That's what, when you hear people talk about the authorized, somebody said amen right there. That's, I know. Uh, 1611 AD, that's the authorized King James Version of the Bible. It, it was translated. This is it, it, a big deal, guys. Uh, it was translated uh, by, by uh, let me find it there, by 47 scholars under the uh, authorization of uh, King James. Okay, so this is, uh, it, it is a big deal. Um, I had something else I wanted to talk about that. Uh, okay, so the Bishop's Bible of 1568 was the basis of the, of the uh, King James Version. They also uh, brought some, some information from Tyndale's translation, which led to the Bishop's Bible. But the Hebrew and Greek texts were studied and other translations consulted. And, they, and that's why it's such a respected uh, version of the Bible. It's because they looked at the, uh, the original manuscripts that they had to make sure it was the most accurate to the original manuscripts possible. And uh, that became the very, um, the, the most popular version of the scripture for over 350 years. And so when you're looking at the work that was done there, uh, it's pretty impressive. 1881 to 1885, the re revised version, uh, let me put that up there. Uh, the revised version, uh, um, that was, that was uh, a revised version of the authorized King James Version of 1611. And it reached back to mo the most ancient copies of the original scripture. Uh, 1900 to 1901, the American Standard Version was an updated version of the revised version of 1885, incorporating the preferred uh, renderings of the American members of the same committee. And then from 1952 until now, yeah, sorry about that, 1952 until now, uh, there have been more trans uh, translations completed in the last 60 years than there have in the previous 2,000 years uh, before that. And so 
uh, we look at that and no wonder people believe that this is probably a fulfillment of the, many believe, a fulfillment of, the, uh, of, the, of what uh, said in Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the, in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Amen. So I, I believe we're living in the last of the last days. And this is just another one of those fulfillments of uh, prophecy that's occurred. Because we have more translations of the Bible uh, than ever before. I want to deal with this real quickly, and I don't, I'm not going to get to go through everything, but I do want to talk about this before we break tonight. Um, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, 1947. Because we told you at the time, uh, the earliest text that we had found, 200 uh, of, the, of the Old Testament, uh, just really uh, second century uh, B.C. Was, was where those were. But in 1947, uh, me and Pastor Cody, Pastor Rob, some of us, we'd been there um, uh, me and Cody, we climbed up some of the caves. <laughs> we, we, we had to make that trek when we was in, in, in Qumran. And we climbed up to some of the caves. There's a, there's a little shepherd boy looking for a goat. Was that, was that the story? Looking for a lost goat. Um, that he, he threw a rock down into one of the caves to see if anything was in there. And he heard something break. And it was pottery that con, uh, contained some of these vessels with, with writings. Uh, articles with writings on them. And it was, uh, these were the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Qumran, uh, caves at Qumran overlooked the Dead Sea. And so what, what was so amazing about this was manuscripts that were a thousand years older than any known manuscripts of books of the Old Testament were discovered. So now think about that. This is, this is, this is monumental. That that, that people would argue that, yeah, okay, you, you claim that the Old Testament is what you say it is, but your, your manuscripts are not really old enough to be, to be really reliable. They found manuscripts a thousand years older. And this is the other thing that you have to realize. When did Israel become a nation? 1948, right? The, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls let, paved a way for the establishment of the nation of Israel because until this time, historically, people would not give validity to the fact that there was a homeland, that the Jewish people had a homeland in modern-day Israel. But when they found, man, I, you know what? You can feel the Holy Spirit just talking about this. But when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls that dated back a thousand years older than any other Old Testament text, it showed them, the writings proved that the Jewish people had a biblical homeland in the heart of, 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 biblical, of modern day Israel. And it paved a way um, for establishing Israel as a nation in 1948. Uh, it may not have passed in 48 if it hadn't been for the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the biblical text in 1947 that gave validity to the argument of a biblical homeland, a biblical heartland there in Israel and, and where they're still settled to today and still fighting over uh, their right to be there until today. Okay. Um, now what we've got, it, what we, we, we kind of see where, where the text came from, historical uh, value to that. But our response to this, now I just want to talk about this very, very quickly. But our response to all of this is we have to believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. We have to believe that what is written in the scripture is absolutely the word of God. It's infallible. Uh, I, I believe it. You know, in the old church, we used to say, I believe it from Genesis to maps. <laughs> uh, because for some of you, I, you know what these new Bibles? Oh, Yeah. See, if you don't have like a paper Bible, some of you guys use U version, but in the back of your Bible, there's maps back there. So we used to say, I believe it from Genesis to maps. And so the maps are not a part of the original writings, okay? And so I, I would say that. But, but uh, you have to believe that the scripture is absolutely everything um, that we, uh, we were to base our lives on, okay? So that's kind of where we get our Bible from. And I hope that increases your faith. I hope that increases your confidence. Uh, that when we read the Word of God, it is absolutely the Word of God, not just some kind of uh, emotional collection of writings that we put together to, to make us feel good about church. Okay. All right, we got any questions, Pastor Cody? Okay, just a few. All right, great. Okay. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't start at Genesis. <laughs> I would not start at Genesis. You know what? Uh, read the Gospels. I, I say if you, if you don't start out with the Gospel, read John. Uh, and follow that up 
with uh, Mark. Maybe go back to Matthew. Um, uh, I, I always love, let's, let's, let's read Romans. Uh, Romans is a great, great book to read. Um, read Galatians, read 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Uh, just, you know, that, I, w- I, would, I would say if, um, if I'm a new believer, uh, then start out, start out in the Gospels. Uh, because you're going to learn who Jesus is. Everything that we, we love our life on is based on Jesus. And so uh, I would say start in the Gospels. If you want to start, if you want to know a Gospel, I'd start in the Gospel of John. Go back, maybe read Mark, do, do uh, Matthew, and then Luke after that. I would do it in that order probably if I was going to be the one reading it. That's personal preference. But I, I would probably, if you want to read some of the writings of the Apostle, I'd start out in Romans. I love Romans. So what about you guys? What, what's your all's opinion on that? Some of you preachers. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Luke and Acts together. That's great. All right. Yeah. Okay, so tra- first of all, let's talk about biblical translations. Um, translations, they are word. What I what I what I look for is I want a word for word translation, and so um, I, the ESV is a word for word translation. If you want something, I like the King James. I like the New King James. Um, I think the the New Living Translation is a word for word. Uh, translation. It's another great translation. So if I'm looking for a translation of the Bible, then I would go uh, word for word translation. I'm not against using paraphrases for um, as, as support, right? Because sometimes I'll go and read a paraphrase. Now, paraphrase, that can be like a, a, uh, a, a, a the Message Bible is a paraphrase. Uh, it's not a word for word translation. They, they take the the, the meaning of maybe a, a passage of Scripture, and they put that whole passage of Scripture into their own words. Um, the uh, NIV is, is not going to be a word-for-word translation. Uh, sometimes they, it's a, they, they do a phrase-by-phrase translation. They translate it by phrase. So that's not going to be a word-for-word. I, I, personally, I think stick to a word-for-word translation. That way you get the accuracy of the text. When it comes to commentary, I think you have to uh, research the individual himself. Who, who wrote the commentary? Um, you know, we, Matthew Henry's always been a, a, a solid commentary on the Bible, and so um, uh, that's that's. I think that's solid. What what are the commentaries you guys use? Zonderman, Zonder, if you want Spirit Field, Zonderman does a Spirit Field commentary on the Bible. Um, what else, guys? What do you guys use? Yeah. Hey, sometimes you got to take it by, and this is, this is not saying anything about any, but um, like um, I, I did my doctorate at a, at a, uh, a Southern Baptist uh, seminary. And so I, I, some of those lectures, I could, hear, I could hear Southern Baptist doctrine that may not have been uh, Bible doctrine, okay? If you're going to do things like that, then you need to be versed enough in the Scripture to where you're able to take uh, me, me and uh, Brother Rob was talking about it yesterday, doing coffee. Uh, so when, you're, when you're listening to things like that, reading things like that, it's kind of like eating trout that you catch. You got you to gotta enjoy the fish and spit out the bones. Okay? I don't, I don't uh, recommend that to new believers, but if, if you've been a believer for a while and you are going out to other commentaries and listening to other, other things, then, then, uh, then just make sure you, you're well-versed in the Scripture yourself. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. Of, I bought a CSV. I like it. Most times, defending 
more the dividing third version of the Amplified Ten, the spirit filled faith. Yeah. Uh, so they didn't write a lot about on the text as much as how it was good then. Yeah. That makes sense. Hey, that's, that's a good one. Um, you know, first of all, how do we treat it as a living document? Is we, we adjust our lives to it and, and not the other way around. Um, because there, there's been a, a lot of uh, people try over the last, especially the last couple of decades, to make adjustments to the Bible, to take things out of the Bible. Uh, hey, well, I said last couple of decades. That's been done for years. Uh, we, were, we were touring uh, Monticello uh, um, a year or so ago, and they were talking about the Jeffersonian Bible. And Thomas Jefferson went in with the razor blade and, uh, and cut out just the, the section that he wanted. And uh, how long was it they said that Thomas Jefferson's, the Jeffersonian Bible was? I can't remember. But it's, I, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, 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 it's just a very small, because he, he basically cut out everything. He cut out anything to do with atonement, anything to do with, with uh, uh, resurrection, redemption, anything. He, he cut it all out. And so... Um, yeah, yeah, I was thinking 16, but you, you're, you're probably right. You're probably 14. Um, but how do we treat it like a living document? Um, is we, we, realize that, well, we realize that we have to adjust our life to it, not the other way around. Um, that, that when we read it, we can get something different out of it every single time we read it because it's a living document. Uh, it's like speaking to a person. Luckily... Um, I've, I've had a chance to do, uh, uh, to do either coffee or dinner or a meeting with, with Rob a few times now, and we don't tell the same stories every time. Well, we do repeat some, don't we, Rob? We don't tell the same stories every time. We don't tell the same stories every time. Why? Because we're living people, and we want to say something different and get new revelations and new ideas and new knowledge every time we see each other. Same way with the Bible. Same way with the Bible. That every time you read it, me, me and uh, Vip was talking about it uh, uh, this afternoon. That that scripture that I preached out of in the book of Mark this morning. I'd never seen it the way that I'd preached it this morning until recently. About the, the blind man at Bethsaida. That his eyes were healed the second time. It was my, I remember the first time. His mind was healed the second time. Well, how did I get that revelation? Because it's a living document. The Bible's alive. It's speaking to us. And so I read it the first time. And I see the miracle of the, of the healing of the eyes. But here I am 25 years later reading that same account. Probably for the 200th time. And I see something new in it because it's living. And how can we differentiate it from other books? Well, just what I said, uh, give priority to it because it is a living document. There are seasons that you may have to put down the, you know, whatever you read, the Inquirer. I, I, like for, for me, I gave up, when I was writing, when I was writing my dissertation in school, um, in, in, in grad school for education, I, I stopped reading fiction literature. I know some of you guys that are in the literature, it breaks your heart. So I've not read fiction in almost a decade, all right? So I've not read fiction literature. What I decided to do is, even after I wrote that dissertation, I never went back to reading fiction literature anymore because if I want to read stories that are going to change my life, I want to go to the Bible. And so I think you give it preeminence over anything else that you read. I'm not saying you don't need to read fiction. Ah, I got one of those, yes. Spirit for Life Study Bible is a good one. What about you guys? How do you differentiate in, in your life? I know, like with Cody, Cody tells me all the times about books he reads, but guess what those books are about? <laughs> there you go. So how, how, do you, how do you make sure that it has preeminence in your life is everything revolves around it. Yes. Amen. It's the only book.
Yeah, Moses. Yeah, Moses in, in uh, 19, uh, 19th century B.C. said the life of the flesh is in the blood. And uh, we, we, had, we had people 3,000 years later that still trying to bleed people and let blood out to try to cure diseases because <laughs> they didn't realize they were killing people. By, and Moses knew it 3,000 years earlier. <laughs> it, it defends itself. Yeah. Yeah. His father would have interaction with Adam through the different life cycles. Yeah. He would have gave that to Noah to put it on the ark and rode it down as well. Yeah. Yeah, there there are eyewitness accounts that were handed down. If you look if you do the research, you know, there's no the food list, the oldest man there ever lived, nine hundred and sixty nine years ago, died in the year of the flood. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, so the, that, that shows you just the, the validity over and over and over again biblically in these people's lives when they share it, and that's what led to the flood, you know, and the, the rise. Yeah. And, and he would have got the information, the people would have got the information from the guy who was first created. Yeah. It wasn't like this, somebody told him, it was the guy who God created. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, here, we messed it up, man, this is why it happened, we messed it up. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't study that that particular in history, and so uh, I can I can look at that and bring back. So I don't know. Do you guys you guys have any knowledge of that? Yep, yep. Me as well. Me as well. And and what what years was that? What did, what did they say? Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We'll follow you up. Yeah, I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Any more? All right. Any questions in here? I know there's different schools of thought here because people want to be, be to be educated in order to defend. Um, but I've also seen people who are not strong enough in the faith um, to process that, uh, and it causes confusion and doubt. And so uh, I would just be weary uh, of, of diving too deep. It's kind of like anything else. It's kind of like a, you know, you know, it's like diving into. I got a, I got a friend right now. He's a Christian friend and. Uh, he's convinced that the world may end tomorrow during the eclipse. And so I, I don't know. Um, because he, d he dove down some rabbit holes on social media. And uh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's convinced that, um, I don't, that the eclipse is moving in a cross-like pattern since the last one and, and all these other things. And I'm not saying that it's not, guys. I'm just saying, yeah, see you Wednesday for church. I, yeah. Um, that, that's I, so I'm I'm not <laughs> I was trying to be a lot nicer than that Pastor Rob said it so I was just repeating what he's that was going to be one of those things that Ashley was going to say you could have said that a little nicer and so um, I wasn't going to say it um, I, I think sometimes you can dive down a rabbit hole and if the early church fathers uh, who who probably had more training on the original text than we have and studied them a lot more than we do found that there was controversy in them and, and, and things that were questionable in them, um, then there's, there's a reason they were not included. And so, um, and, and we know that. We, we, we know that, uh, you know, the, the writings of the book of Judas, the writings of Thomas, and some of those, there, there, there are events in there that have been proven 
that are not factual. And so that's the reason why that they were not included in the original canon of Scripture. And so I, I would be very um, careful if I decided uh, to read that. I, I don't feel the need personally to read that. There's, there's, so much, there's so much that I don't know about our own Scripture to spend time doing something else. You know, I, I would say that. Anything else? Mm -hmm. No, 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 it's not. It's just not in our, in our canon. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not in, in our canon of scripture is not included. Yep. But yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not, it's not the satanic Bible. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, it is definitely not. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Hearing none. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, hopefully, if nothing else, you'll see that, that Scripture is um, historically valid, historically reliable, and uh, therefore it can increase our faith. All right? So let's pray and just ask God. We went over time, and I don't like to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the question's fault. It wasn't our fault. It's the question's fault. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we just ask you to lead us and to guide us in our study of your word, in our walk of faith. And God, uh, we trust you. And as you continue to allow us to, to uh, walk this journey together, uh, allow uh, your love and your truth to continue. And we just thank you for what you're doing. In your name we pray. And